Good uh, late morning to everybody. And for those who are coming in, just uh, uh, urge you to take a seat as quick as you can. Uh, it's a delight to be here at this uh, Net Zero Nuclear Summit. Uh, the MP and I had a chance to sit in the uh, green room, and I, I promise you quite a lively discussion because he's a very open-minded guy. I'm also delighted to be invited back here because I've been following the journey, Ted, of the Baraka nuclear facility uh, for 12 years, having covered it at its opening and then the third reactor. And now, as His Excellency uh, Mohammed Al Hamadi talked about, the fourth reactor is on play. Uh, I'd love to start with you as a torchbearer, if you will, for nuclear energy in Australia. It, it hasn't had nuclear energy since the 1990s, right? It's just not part of the equation. Uh, but you think this is the right time, and I know there's better than 50 percent of installed capacity for electricity and coal, and the Albanese government is very interested in trying to get as much renewables on, which you support, uh, but there's a big but, and you have a difference. Should we start there? It's probably a good place to start, and so, as many of you might know, uh, Australia has never had nuclear energy, um, but candidly, in order for us to reach net zero, we need it. Um, if there is no nuclear, there is no net zero when it comes to Australia's electricity system. And you're right too that, you know, we come from a system that has been dominated by coal. And right now we are seeing an accelerated exit of coal-fired power stations in Australia. In fact, we'll have about 85% of our baseload power exiting the grid by 2035 and there's no guarantee of a replacement. Now, if we are indeed to reach net zero, and we are to ensure that the trilemma of affordability, energy security, and sustainability um, is delivered on, then we need zero emissions nuclear energy. Good. Uh, I think it's good to describe you as a torchbearer for this industry there. I'm really curious what sparked that, and then what does it take to engage society that can help foster that into government, do you think? Is that the strategy? And you've developed a website and you're surveying the population. I think it would be fascinating to find out, do Australians want nuclear power? Well, I think there's no doubt that in a, a very vibrant liberal democracy like Australia, um, you need to have a social license. You, you need the public to come with you. And therefore, a social license is a prerequisite for any major transformation that requires infrastructure that impacts local communities. And, and uh, nuclear energy will be no different. So it is a prerequisite. For me personally, uh, I didn't grow up as a, as a champion of nuclear energy. Um, uh, far from it, to be honest. I think as a teenager, I, I had my first trip up to Japan. and. And then I visited Nagasaki, and I started being scared about what nuclear was all about, you know, because I was thinking about the atom bomb. But it, it wasn't until years later um, that I started to do the research, and then I entered Parliament, and I led a parliamentary inquiry in Australia on nuclear energy. And the facts just did the talking. It was quite extraordinary. Um, I mean, here we have the, the most dense fuel type that can genuinely save the planet. And in Australia, we have a nuclear reactor for medical isotopes. So we already understand the capacity of nuclear to save lives. As a nation, together with the United States and the United Kingdom, we've signed up to the AUKUS agreement, so we'll be adopting nuclear-propelled submarines. So we understand the capacity of nuclear mm to protect lives. We have the biggest reserves of uranium in the world, so um, we understand the importance that nuclear can play for livelihoods. The question we now need to ask ourselves as a nation is should we join most of our allies and partners and have nuclear energy as part of a balanced energy mix? This has become part of the conversation with the Quad. I mean, you're a strategic partner in that arrangement, and would there be alignment and could you make the case that members of the Quad support that vision as well? Does it help your cause? Uh, look, I think it does help because I think um, as we look around the world as Australians, we see those countries that we like to consider 
as peer nations all embracing nuclear energy. I mean, to think we've got 32 economies right now using nuclear energy, you've got up to 50 nations thinking about, seriously exploring, introducing nuclear for the very first time. It doesn't make sense that in Australia, we actually have a moratorium. It is illegal in Australia to establish a civil nuclear program. Um, that's an inherent contradiction um, in a, a liberal democracy like ours, and therefore it's worth something fighting about. Okay, good. I'd like to dig in on the model if we can, because this is a very, obviously, an industry gathering that knows it intimately. Mm. Uh, you have a, a unique challenge in the sense you have vast land area and not a big population. So have you advised with anybody else here that would be attending a summit like this and said, what's the right model to be able to scale up uh, the distribution of nuclear energy in a, in a large country like Australia? So we've been looking at this now for some time and I've had the benefit of meeting probably some people in this room um, and their companies. Um, I think this is the tenth nation I've been to um, where I've sat down with people from the nuclear industry to understand how different countries do it. Um, and Australia, of course, we have our own unique um, electricity grid. So we are looking at micro reactors, small modular reactors and large reactors. We're only interested in the new and emerging technology, so generation three plus and beyond. And then we are looking at what is the right market entry strategy for Australia? Where should we start? With mm. which technology? Um, and I don't believe it's the role of government to choose the vendor per se, but at least the class of technology and to understand what a potential implementation plan would be, that is certainly a matter for public policy. Okay, fascinating. H how do you uh, get the, the public engaged, do you think? I mean, I'm wondering if you want to apply that to the rest of the industry. This was coming up at, even in the first panel with uh, the director, Oliver Stone, uh, putting together documentaries. I've been involved in this group, you know, for a better part of 12 years and watching their journey. And I see about halfway through the UAE journey, the global view of nuclear has changed quite radically. So how do you make that click, do you think, in Australia? Is, what is, sort of effort does it take? Well, my view is Australians, um, they can smell a fake a mile away. <laughs> Which means you just have to be completely open and transparent from the get-go. <laughs> Um, which is why we had a federal election um, last year. And uh, actually, no, not last year, now 18 months ago. And we were open from day one with the Australian public saying, we're now in opposition, the coalition, and we think we should be considering nuclear energy. And I think the more you talk about it, the more it normalises in conversation. And so long as people know that you're not out there to trick them, you're being completely transparent. I think it's the only way to carry people in a democracy like Australia. Okay, I looked at a poll which I thought was interesting that 15% of Australians say they don't pay any attention at all to news about climate change. And I was sharing with you in the green room, that's two times the global average, maybe like 7% of the population. I'm not saying they're climate deniers, but just say, okay, either it's too frightening, I don't want to tune in, or I don't believe in it. Uh, so with that in mind, and I've watched a lot of coverage and read a lot about Australia and the clear and present danger from climate change, uh, how do you make that case for nuclear in that context uh, in terms of they, they see what's taking place now, right? I don't think there's any debate to the, what you've been faced with, with fires and extreme storms and the rest. What do you think? Oh, look, I think the vast, vast majority of Australians want real action on climate change. And so I think the debates about should we act on climate change, is it real, all of those types of things are behind us. There's only one question at hand for a country like Australia, and that's the question of how. Mm. How do we decarbonise our own nation? How do we join global efforts to do so? And where the target is net zero by 2050, that's a bipartisan goal in Australia. Both sides of the political fence know what the destination is, what's outstanding, and where the debate lies is how we get there. Mm. And the goal has to be more than just decarbonising our economy. 
We've got to have a vision for what our nation looks like in 2050. Mm. And I want our nation to be a prosperous one, a strong one, a fiercely independent one within the Indo-Pacific, um, and one that reaches that target. And so it's a, a balanced mix of objectives that we have to keep our eye on. Um, but the real question is just how do we now get there? And that's where nuclear comes in. Okay, very good. Now, I wanted to pick up two things with you. The, uh, the Labor government said through their capacity investment scheme that they wanted to underwrite 32 gigawatts of uh, nine storage facilities, so new technology and battery storage, and 23 variable renewable energy installations, right? Uh, it doesn't give you the base load that you've uh, rightly pointed out, but what don't you like about what the government's doing? They're not being transparent about the cost here and then perhaps the unreliability of that nuclear, not the nuclear, but the renewable installations? I, I think the starting point for me is um, I grapple with the current Australian government's renewables only approach. They have an objective of 82% renewables on our grid by 2030 and then up to nearly 100% thereafter. Um, I think renewables are vitally... So 100% by 2040, am I correct? Is that the goal? Uh, look, they haven't been clear on that. Um, there's an integrated system plan, they call it, um, which suggests by 2050 it might be around about 98%. Now, um, the, the, the challenge here is um, renewables are vitally important, and I believe they are. But I don't believe that they can do the job on their own. And I don't believe the end goal, or if you like, if you're going to define the problem to be solved, you don't define it as being reaching a target for one technology to be so dominant. Um, I believe in the optimum level of renewables on the Australian grid, not the maximum level. And I think therein lies a very big distinction between the two sides of politics. Okay, we had a great uh, presentation uh, from David and Stefan this morning, kind of looking at the global landscape. But one of the things that stood out for me in the report uh, in the presentation they uh, suggested, and this came up during COP28 in a number of the sessions I was chairing, is that grids aren't fit for purpose, right? So you can make this investment in nuclear, uh, renewable battery storage, but the grid system has to be, uh, have the capacity to absorb it all. Uh, what's the state of play for Australia and the grid? And uh, is that a priority? for the Albanese government, how do the Liberals see it? Um, Australia's grid is not fit for purpose now. Um, you know, Australia is a federation, and so its grid came from a, a historical background of individual states and state governments controlling their grids. Um, and then there was an attempt to integrate those grids. And so on the east coast, where the majority of Australians live, it's the, the national electricity um, market. Now, um, over time, because so many renewables have come in, that integrated system, which was a baseload based system, is now trying to deal with a system that's going to become increasingly um, made up of, um, of intermittent technologies. Um, one of the problems being faced at the moment is not just the interconnections between them, but also um, the, the wiring, there are not enough transmission lines. And so in order for the government to achieve its objective, uh, it needs somewhere north of 10,000 kilometres of new transmission lines built, mm. up to 30,000 kilometres of new transmission lines, and that is because it is looking at renewables doing all of the heavy lifting, mm. whereas our approach is one that embraces renewables as part of an all of the above approach. Um, so that, yep, it's important, but part of a balanced mix. And one of the things that fascinates me as I've looked at nuclear energy is the idea of replacing retiring coal-fired power plants with next generation nuclear plants. Because again, you can leverage that infrastructure, especially the transmission lines. Not only is that good from an economics perspective, um, but also, when you look at getting buy-in from local communities, there are so, so far fewer communities that you need to try and win over with getting new transmission lines. The more we can leverage existing infrastructure, the better. 
Yeah, I noticed in, uh, after the elections, we had some uh, local elections, and in certain seats, they shifted back to coal, right? Uh, even with uh, labor government there. So this has been pronounced, and you're saying that the coal power hasn't been that reliable, so it's quite a testing window, is it not? It, it's a testing window because, um, and this again goes to where the existing system isn't fit for purpose. Even the way the market is operated is not fit for purpose because it's not a capacity type market. And so they do not reward um, commercially existing capacity of gas, of coal, which means the coal plants do not have a financial incentive to maintain the, the maintenance spend. Um, and therefore, um, you know, they grapple with their own reliability. So all of those problems are coming into play. But ironically enough, you're right, there are some states in Australia I say ironically because these states are the ones who are very vocally against coal, but they are doing secret deals effectively with coal plants to keep them open because they also say no to gas and they know that you're going to need the base load. And so we've got this sort of very difficult situation at the moment. Um, some state governments are doing deals with coal plants because they need to keep the lights on. Um, and they're the same state governments that are refusing um, ex ex exploration and extraction of gas. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex situation. It certainly is. It's very tricky and it's very uh, mm. political. I'd love to get your thoughts before we wrap up here, yeah. Ted, if it's okay, on uh, the Premier's visit to China recently, right? It was the first uh, Prime Minister to do so in uh, seven years. And you guys have taken some pretty nasty knocks from China with sanctions and pretty bad tensions on coal exports and tariffs and the rest. And I notice, and I don't quite agree with uh, some of the comments in the opening panel today, U.S. is trying to reach out to China. We had Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, the Commerce Secretary had some fairly stiff words, but the message is they want to have a dialogue with President Xi. And you saw the ASEAN meeting in San Francisco. Uh, can you be competing with China and still have decent relations because, you know, there's competition in AI, there's competition in the nuclear sector, you're a major coal exporter to them. How do you see it from the Australian point of view, uh, the US, China strains, but the kind of a willingness it seems to collaborate now? Well, certainly through COVID um, and Australia did become the victim of some economic coercion on the part of, uh, of China, there were people calling for complete decouplings of, of economies, um, and I disagree entirely with that. Um, it's foolish, and in practice, it just simply wouldn't happen. But nevertheless, um, my personal view is that we have seen a decoupling um, at the very high technology end between the US and China, um, especially around you know, space, virtual reality, um, critical minerals. Um, being in North America earlier this year, um, my personal observation was that next generation nuclear may indeed be falling into that category. Um, whether that's the case or not, um, um, others are far better qualified than I to comment. So I do think that um, in order to have resilient supply chains, um, countries need to have confidence about those on whom they rely. And that includes Australia as a medium power. Um, but, you know, we trade very strongly with China. I believe that will continue, but we have to be clear-eyed and we have to make sure that our own supply chain is not overly reliant. Good. Um, COP28, a very busy agenda, one that saw uh, the loss and damage fund completed from the start. Now we need to get it replenished the to the $100 billion with the original aspirations, but a heck of a start. Food and agriculture, even our diets on the agenda. You saw the, the alliance here, the declaration with 22 countries going to 24, as His Excellency was talking about. What are your, your views here? This seems to be a very practical, action-oriented COP, uh, overemphasis on phasing down or phasing out of fossil fuels. But what is your take, takeaway? Because the real action seems to be the real deal, if you will. Well, uh, look, I, I suppose maybe as an Australian, um, I'm probably a, a pragmatist. <laughs> and, 
And so I prefer action plans that are implementable, you can actually do. Um, and so I think there's a degree of realism that's kicking in. Um, and I think that's where the communique on nuclear um, has found its place here. And thankfully, we now have COPs taking zero emissions nuclear energy seriously. And um, there is no credible pathway to net zero as a world unless we have it as part of the mix. But so too, I think we need pragmatism when it comes to other technologies, including carbon capture and storage, for example, with gas. Um, we are going to um, continue as a world to rely on fossil fuels, and therefore the objective has to be how do we abate them mm. in countries like Australia as coal plants retire, um, can we replace them uh, with nuclear reactors? Um, but all of this comes down to some meticulous planning. And uh, again, you, you, we need to have a degree of realism and not be overly ideological or dreamy. Uh, we need real plans because the public will find you out pretty quickly <laughs> if it's full of promises and dreams and you haven't actually delivered the real outcomes. Great. I was sharing this story with Ted that uh, one time during my World Economic Forum coverage, I was asked to interview a premier from Australia. I said, why is that? And they said, well, he got on the airplane and like halfway through his journey before he landed in Switzerland, he was ousted by his own party. It gets uh, pretty rough and tumble as you uh, notified here. It's uh, great to have you make the journey. Thanks very much. I'm sure the, the leadership here is very happy that you did so. And thanks for being so open-minded on all the topics as well. Ted O'Brien, can we give a nice uh, round of applause? Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for seeing you.